Hello, everybody. Uh, this, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today we're going to be discussing a subject, the identity of Jesus. And uh, I can't really think personally of any subject that would be better than this, discussing who Jesus is. Uh, so I'm excited about it. And I'm going to uh, introduce our two uh, guests here. Uh, first of all, we got Mecca Wing Zero, uh, Brother Jackson. And uh, would you say hi to everybody, Jackson? Just introduce yourself and tell them a little bit about your channel. All right, sure. Uh, thanks, Brother Luke. My name is Jackson. I am I'm a Christian with Asperger syndrome. Um, I I'm in college right now, and. I really enjoy analyzing things. I see myself as more of a Bible student than a Bible teacher, and I haven't uploaded very many videos that have, so far, but the few that I have are kind of more of an analytical type, so I think that's mainly where God has me, if that makes sense. So. Yeah. Let me say that uh, since uh, um, last time you actually made the decision to start uploading your own videos, right. and I've seen them, and they're very good, very interesting. Not necessarily always about theology, but still find them very interesting. I'm glad you're, you're kind of coming out of the closet and, and, and showing the world your thoughts here on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I'm afraid my video about the, the castle I have over there doesn't have much to do with theology. But. Yeah, but it was still it was still cute and interesting. My my son always loved playing with Legos too. I still he I think he still has a ton of them. And he's 33 years old. For anyone out there who's looking for a great, unique, kind of vintage gift for their child or grandchild, you can get that set on eBay for not that expensive, so. Yeah, very good. Okay, and next we have uh, Brother Mitchell Belenkoff. Hello. And, uh, he's been on this program a few times, and, and uh, Brother Mitch, tell everybody just a little bit about your YouTube channel. Well, um, I started the channel... Um, and I got, got involved in YouTube because I also have uh, Asperger's Syndrome. And my main concern with people with Asperger's Syndrome, uh, a lot of us are very antisocial. We seem normal on the outside, but, but, but really it's very difficult for us to, um, to socialize. Amen. And in, in some of the churches that I've been to, it actually is detrimental because the, the doctrines actually make us obsessive over over uh, over our how righteous we, we have to make ourselves to the point where we'll drive ourselves uh, insane. And so I basically made the ministry so that people with Asperger's syndrome would be able to come to some place where they can learn biblical teaching without having that uh, heavy burden on their back uh, and also um, sitting in church and, and, and being around people and being uncomfortable. I have to say that one of the most the terrible things that happens to me is when I go to church, right, and the first thing that happens is turn around and greet the person behind you. I want to, I want to hide. Oh. <laughs> I can't be that so bad. So, so, uh, you know, so basically, uh, I, I'm a, definitely a Bible. Uh, I really study uh, just like like Jackson does. I, I, I'm a very analytical type of person, and I study things a little bit deeper than maybe uh, some other people who don't have that inclination, that obsessive inclination might have. So I uh, come up with things that might be might be um, uh, new to a lot of people. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I'm sure that if you have Asperger's, many times you kind of feel like the odd man out when you're in a group of people. But today, uh, I am the odd man out. <laughs> you guys... <laughs> You guys are the norm, and I'm I'm the oddity here because I'm not like the rest of the group. Uh, but let me just say that uh, from my experience with uh, Mitchell, uh, Mitch, uh, he's uh, uh, is very analytical, and he seems to see things in scriptures that many people just uh, miss. We, so that maybe this Asperger's, in a way, is a, a blessing in disguise because they are more analytical than uh, the rest of us seem to be. So I hope you'll uh, subscribe to. Uh, the channel Mecca Wings Hero, that's Brother Jacks, and then uh, subscribe to Brother Mitch's channel. It's just his name, Mitchell Belenkoff. All right, uh, and for those of you who know me, uh, Brother Luke, my channel is Sin City Preacher, 
And, and I'm going to start the program by just asking each of the, the panelists here to just, uh, in, in, as briefly as you can, answer this question. Uh, Jesus asked this question to his apostles in Luke 9.20. That Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? So if you had to keep it within like, you know, a 15 or 30 second answer, how do you answer the question, who do you say that I am, about Jesus? Should I start? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, right. I would say that he is both God the Son and the Son of God, fully God and fully man. That's the most succinct explanation I can give. Okay. That's succinct, all right, and it's uh, certainly uh, very accurate. Obviously, we could really, we're going to probably do uh, probably five, six, seven hours on this subject, so therefore there's a lot that could be said about who he is. That's the whole topic for the show. If I'm asking you to reduce like eight hours down to 15 seconds. <laughs> so Mitch, can you do that? Well, his name, Yeshua, um, the significance of the name Yeshua is God saves. And that's the shortest, most, it's actually his name is the gospel. The good news is that God saves. Nobody else, we don't save, we can't save ourselves, only God saves. And he saved through the one he sent to earth, Yeshua, to take our place in judgment or be judged for us on the cross so that we would be resurrected with him to eternity, um, and to eternally saved. Yeah, I, um, I'm surprised how many people I've met on YouTube that don't seem to emphasize this point, what the, the meaning of the name of Jesus. I know, Mitch, you've, you've mentioned it dozens of times. I've seen, heard you discuss it in your videos. Uh, I've mentioned it many times, too. And I think that this is one of the most important people points to understand. Jesus' name, that's why we say we call him the name of the Lord Jesus, and we believe in his name. Uh, well, what does that mean? It means his name actually tells us, as, you, as Mitch said, uh, the message of salvation. God saves through this person, Jesus Christ. Okay? Uh, now, for me, to answer the question, I'm going to read a statement of faith. It's a few, few sentences that uh, I published uh, on my uh, every one of my videos. I'm getting a little bit of feedback from somebody. Maybe your the audio is up a little bit higher. But, uh, I'm going to uh, read this because this is my kind of answer to the question of who Jesus is. And it says, Jesus is the object of my faith. Jesus Christ is the eternal God, the only Savior, and the sole source of eternal life. Jesus is the eternal God manifest in the flesh as the Son of God. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid for the sins of the whole world. When Jesus rose from the dead, he proved he has power over life and death. Jesus offers salvation and eternal life as a free gift to everyone. We receive the gift of eternal life through faith alone, Christ alone. Our salvation is eternally secure. We cannot lose it for any reason. So if anybody wants to know what my channel stands for, my core beliefs, uh, you'll see that if you click on my channel where it says about. That's my statement of faith. So uh, that's, uh, that's the, the short answer that we have for everybody as far as the identity of Jesus. Now we're going to look at some scriptures and discuss them and uh, try to garner more uh, more information to answer this question. Let's start with John 14, 9. And, uh, Jesus uh, says, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. He answered, he, he made this statement to answer the question. One of the apostles says, Show us the Father. Jesus said, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So, uh, uh, how about Jackson? You want to elaborate on that voice? What does it mean when Jesus says, "He that has seen me has seen the Father"? Well, I think it, I think it debunks this idea that many false religions teach out there, which is that, that Jesus is not deity. You know, 
because obviously pretty much every religion that claims a tie to the Bible teaches that the Father is God. If you've seen me and you've seen the Father, I think that's equating the two, if that makes sense. It's putting putting them on an equal playing field, so to speak. And I, I'd say, I, I, don't, I don't think it means that they're not distinct from each other, but it does mean that they are not, quote unquote, separate from each other. Okay, very good. You had used a lot of key words there. Distinct, separate, um, equal, and so on. So these are things that we're going to elaborate on further. But Brother Mitch, what do you have to say about this verse? He that well, to me is in the Father. When I, when I see this whole picture here, I, I kind of look at the, the Ark of the Covenant. Now this is the, this is the Jewish people who carried this Ark around that had the, the Ten Commandments in it, but actually it was like, uh, like God being with them, and wherever they went, this Ark went with them and went before them in battle, so God was with them. And one of the names for, for Jesus is Emmanuel, which means God with us. Um, and the, the idea of salvation itself, the spirit of the Father um, being in the Son, but being two separate, uh, you know, kind of a Trinitarian view. The way I look at this is that that in, in Isaiah, I think it was 44, uh, around that area, he, he talked about, I, I am the only rock, and I, I will perform this salvation for you. So, so it, it, it's hard language to understand, but how could you give glory to somebody who is a person who did this in the place of God and give God the glory for what he did? So, and, and, and the other thing is, I think I mentioned it last week, if it was just a regular person that did this and lived a sinful life, how would God ever get the glory? So, so this whole idea that, 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 that they're, they're one and the same in spirit and, 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 and distinct um, also, also gives the idea that, that God himself or the essence, all the essence of the, or the fullness of the Godhead came down and died for us. So we wouldn't give glory to a man, but God okay. is. Brother, you, you mentioned a, a three more key words. I need to write these down as I'm going, otherwise I'll forget. But I think you said distinct, uh, you said trinity, and essence. And these words here are important words in understanding this, and we're going to be, be reviewing the meaning of those words a little bit more as we go along. But first of all, uh, Jackson, you are going to about, about to say something. Huh? Oh, I thought you were about to say something. No, no, I was just nodding in agreement. Oh, okay. Uh, all right, you see, I'm, I'm so attentive, I even acknowledge nodding. <laughs> okay, um, let me pick up where uh, Mitch used the word Trinitary, Trinitarian or Trinity. When we uh, look at Jesus as God, uh, then... How do you explain this? Uh, some people explain it through the concept of the Trinity. Uh, personally, uh, I hold this doctrine of, as a Trinitarian. Uh, other people, they, they still agree that Jesus is God Almighty, but they uh, explain it in a different way. and that's, They look at it as oneness or modalism. So as we go through these verses here, we're going to find a lot of verses that one side or the other, the Trinitarian or the modalist, might grab a hold of to, to uh, claim that as their proof text. And this here verse here, he that has seen me has seen the Father, could be a proof text for a modalist because they believe uh, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is one person that simply changes forms, operates in three different modes. Whereas the Trinitarian believes that uh, these are three distinct persons, and yet there's only one God. Uh, that's the, the Trinity. So uh, the, the modalist believes that uh, they're not three simultaneous distinct persons. Uh, they both, God operates in one mode at a time that simply changes modes. Or the word manifest. God was manifest in the flesh, is another verse we'll go over. They say that God manifests himself. As the, as the Father, manifests himself as the Son, manifests himself as the Holy Spirit, but 
only one at a time, not um, uh, simultaneously existing in three modes. Whereas the Trinitarian said, no, he's three distinct persons simultaneously uh, operating at, at the same time. So we'll be going through this and uh, uh, discussing this point as we go along. But when Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, you can see how Immodalus would grab that verse and say, see, Jesus is claiming that he is the Father. Whereas a Trinitarian say, no, Jesus is not the Father. Well, now let's go to the next book, verses, John 10, 30, 31. This is another verse that a modalist might grab a hold of. It says, I and my Father are one. Now, the Jews answered him saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Uh, first of all, I've, had, I've encountered people who said to me, Jesus never claimed to be God. Uh, but you can take verses like these and say, these are actual statements by Jesus where he is claiming to be God. When he says, the Father, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, or the Father and I are one, uh, we can take that as a uh, claim to deity. At least that's what the Jews did because they wanted the stoning because they said, Thou makest thyself God. So the Jews interpreted this as Jesus claiming to be God. So now let's look at I and my Father are one. Jackson, sound on that. Well, I mean, I, I, I guess I should just state up front, I definitely take the Trinitarian view of these two camps. I think that, I think that saying that he's one does not necessarily mean that he is him, but is one in terms of there's only one God and that he's equal to him. Because, here's the thing, if he says, why have, have you forsaken me on the cross? It seems very strange to me for someone to be hanging there saying, why have I forsaken myself? But I do agree, it definitely debunks the, the, the claim that Jesus didn't claim to be God there. I think that that is, um, that, that both the modalist and the Trinitarian can definitely agree on that and use this as a proof test. So. Yeah, a okay, very good point. In your example of Jesus praying to the Father, uh, this is one example of many we'll be going over, where it seems that uh, these are uh, different, distinct uh, uh, persons existing simultaneously, rather than one that simply changes modes. Right, okay. not the like transformer from the old television show. <laughs> okay, Brother Mitch? Yeah, well, as far as that goes, um, you know, he didn't say I and the Father are the same. And so... Uh, oneness, you know, you can interpret it uh, the Greek way, but you have to remember that it, there were Hebrew roots here. There were Aramaic roots here. And the word that was used was echad, which is like a uh, like cluster. You know? uh, there's going to be interpretation one way or the other. And that's why I don't like to commit to one place or the other. I like to state exactly what I see in the scripture for, what, for exactly what it is. To claim that you are one with somebody, I am one with me and my wife are, are one flesh, but that doesn't mean I'm her and she's me. And so, um, uh, so I wouldn't say that Jesus was saying he was the same as the Father. Okay. Uh, well, I know that you uh, do not want to have a label as Trinitarian or Modalist or any other label. I've encountered other people that do not want to uh, embrace any of these labels or these doctrines as they're, both they're defined, but uh, some people say, well, rather than the Trinity, I will refer to it simply as the Godhead. Mm. So, so the Godhead is a way of looking at it without necessarily using the word Trinity, because we know that the word Trinity is not in the Bible, just like, just like the word rapture is not in the Bible. There's a lot of words that are not in the Bible that we, we use to describe the concept. Uh, so, uh, we know that there is the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost are all God, and yet there's one God, so how do you explain that? Well, either modalism or Trinitarianism on the normal ways is plain. Um, okay, I'll, let, me, let me look at I and my Father are one. Uh, a modalist would say that they're one and the same person. who just simply changes forms like a shapeshifter. Um, however, uh, another argument is that no, 
they're, they're, he's not claiming to be one with the Father in terms of uh, uh, equality or deity, but they're saying one in agreement. We, the Father and I are of one mind. We, we are one in agreement. Now, that is another way of people will explain this verse. Uh, but the way that I believe it is meant to be understood is we are one in essence. Or what was the word that you used, Mitch? I wanted to note it earlier. I, I did actually say essence. You, it was essence. Yes, okay. So that's the word. One, or, or one in essence or one in substance. Same kind of idea. They are one substance, the substance that God is. They are both the same in essence or substance. All right, let's move on to Philippians 2.6. Uh, this is the Apostle Paul, and he says, uh, who, he's referring to Jesus, Jesus, being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God. So here's this word that uh, I think, uh, Jackson, you used this word earlier, equality. And uh, Paul is saying that Jesus considered himself to be equal with God. Right. So, what do you say about that? Well, it's it, it actually kind of reminds me back to the story of the rich young ruler, actually, where he says that, where Jesus says, why do you call me good? For there is only one good, and that's God. And some, some people have used that to say, see, Jesus isn't claiming to be God. But what I think is wrong with that is, you know, you ask these same people, is Jesus good? And they, they say, yes, well, then he's God, obviously. There's only one good, and that's God. So I think him saying that he's equal to God means he's good, and that means that he has to be God, because God is, is supreme. Yeah. The idea of being good uh, is uh, it's another idea of a word being watered down. The Bible, when it refers to good in terms of righteousness, perfect. Right. Uh, but people like to think of good in terms of some kind of uh, a degree of good. You know, he's, he's, he's more good than bad, therefore we think he's a pretty good guy, you know. But uh, as we, in, Christ, in Christianity, we see good as you're either perfect or you're not good. <laughs> because good and perfect are synonymous. Well, but, but even like Jehovah's Witnesses don't really believe Jesus was a sinner that I know of. They think he was an archangel or whatever. Yeah, they believe he was Michael the Archangel. But obviously that's not the same as what we believe, so I just thought that I just saw a connection with that verse. So Yeah. So uh, while you while you brought up the subject, you've got Jehovah Witnesses don't believe Jesus is God Almighty, Jehovah. They believe that he is um, what they call it a God, which is like an angel. He's Michael the Archangel. Right. And then you've got Mormons who believe he, he is a god, uh, because they believe in polytheism, they believe in millions and billions, countless numbers of gods all over the universe. Is, uh, and then uh, Muslims, they believe that Jesus is a prophet, uh, but not God. And so uh, all these different religions see this identity of Jesus differently. That's why this is an important study, uh, this topic of the identity of Jesus. It's important to get this right. Hey, Brother Mitch, this idea of being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Can you be equal with God without being God? Well, I, I want to look at this from the perspective of, of the sacrifice he made. He humbled himself. Uh, I think that the next verse was that, that, but he humbled himself and became a man. And But that didn't mean that he humbled himself because he was any less pure than God is. If he wasn't as pure as God himself, his sacrifice wouldn't have, wouldn't have counted for anything on the cross to begin with. So he had to be equal as far as his righteousness was concerned and as far as his position was concerned, but willing to be submissive to the point of being uh, 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 humbling himself and becoming a man uh, sin, not, not, and being sin for man, but not sinning. Um, so... so he also claimed that I, you know, uh, 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 being on a par when he said I am, or when he said statements like I and the Father are one, and did not consider that blasphemy. Uh, so, so when I look at that whole 
situation that, that we're looking at here, I'm, I'm seeing that that Jesus had to be on a par with the Father in order to be a perfect sacrifice for us. Okay, and so Paul is saying here that Jesus did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now, robbery, first to tell me what it means when he doesn't consider it robbery, and then equal with God, is it possible for someone to be equal with God without in fact being God? Next. Not if um, not if we're literally taking the definitions of God and robbing at the same time in your question. Because you know, to, one, one, like one of the five solas is to the glory of God alone, solely gloria, you know, and all throughout scripture you have this idea of God alone being glorified and not us, not our works, not our not our good deeds, not, not our anything. And so therefore, if, if, like if I was equal with God, I, it seems like that would mean that I have the same amount of glory, logically, because being equal would mean the same amount of glory, logically, Therefore, it would not be God alone that would be glorified. So therefore, I think this is just yet another proof of the deity of Christ, is what I would say. Because he's think, not robbing God, and yet he's equal with him. I think you're uh, identifying the robbery with the glory is exactly the right connection to make there. Mitch? I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. You see, Jackson stated it so well that we can't even expound any further. We just have to say amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm just trying to... Okay, here's another, here's another verse that makes the same point. John 5, 1. It said, The Jews sought the more to kill him, Jesus, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. So here you have another example of the Jews wanting to kill Jesus because of Jesus' claims to be God, to be equal with God. The Jews understood that if you say that God's my Father, now Jews had this term, God's our Father, but they never identified themselves personally as God's my Father because that's uh, that's something they couldn't claim, otherwise they would they knew what that meant. That means that they're God too. They're a direct son of God. So when Jesus said God is his father, the Jews interpreted that as he's claiming to be equal to God. And they wanted to kill Jesus over it. And Jackson? Yeah, I think I think uh, um, the equal with God has, has all, not only does it prove the deity of Christ, like I already stated, but again in this verse, I actually think this is a good argument for Trinitarianism as opposed to modalism. Because it seems kind of strange to me to have them be distinct there and saying one is equal to the other with them when, if, if really they're just the same being in, in kind of a different form, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the word distinct, uh, the, it, it's important, a lot of people when they are arguing for uh, Trinitarianism, they're very, very careful to use the word distinct rather than separate. Uh, in other words, we would believe there are three distinct persons, but not three separate persons. They're right. distinct, but not separate, because when we say separate, then we are opening ourselves up to the uh, charge of polytheism, saying there are three separate gods. Yeah, we, we totally are, and we. I remember I was talking to a, a Mormon, this was about a year ago, but I just remember this conversation, and he kept on trying to say, you and I believe the same thing, because you don't, you don't believe in, like, mo modally. First he was kind of trying to argue against modalism with me, then it kind of became clear that I was not a modalist or whatever, and he wanted to say that we believe the same thing, and just the separate and distinct and everything, and it was, it, it, it's... Just, just to repeat, the point, it's a very, very important distinction to make between the two because they're they're totally they're miles apart these doctrines. So, well, let me let me ask everybody to speculate for a moment since we're talking about trinitarian or modalism. Uh, I guess there's really only these two ways of looking at it. it the, uh, those of us who recognize that Jesus is God Almighty, uh, we there's only two ways that I know of. That, that we explain how it's that possible. One is through modalism, one is through Trinitarianism. However, would you venture in 
with all the denominations of Christianity, what percentage do you think hold to modalism, and what percentage holds to Trinitarianism? I haven't done a census on that. <laughs> I'm just asking for some kind of a guess. <laughs> Not official. We're not going to hold you to it. Most denominations in the United States teach Trinitarianism, but there's really uh, only a Pentecostal oneness in Church of Christ. Those are the only ones I know of who identify as modalists. Everybody else that I, I'm familiar with as denominations uh, believe in uh, Trinitarian. Uh, so uh, I would say the vast majority of Christendom. Those are the people who name the name of Jesus and claim that they're Christians, uh, they, uh, the vast majority of them, I would guess probably 90, 95% would be Trinitarian. Uh, if anybody of our viewers know the answer to that, then ask the comment to us. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now let's move on to uh, the idea of First uh, John 2.2. 2. This says, uh, he, meaning Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins. Okay? Not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. But I'm interested in this when it says Jesus is the propitiation. Any verses that say Jesus is, Jesus is, or who Jesus is, is a way of identifying. Him. We're looking at the, the identity of Jesus. And one of the things that we identify Jesus as is the propitiation for our sins. So propitiation, you know, that's one of those big words a lot of people don't uh, may not understand. So how would you define Jesus is the propitiation for us? Is what is propitiation? You want to start, Jackson? Okay. Well, um, last week I answered this question as well, and I I, I mentioned the word sufficiency. You know, it's a it's a payment, but it's a sufficient payment. Too. For example, if I paid one dollar for a car, that wouldn't that I guess you could call that a propitiation, quote unquote, but it wouldn't be a sufficient one. When he's saying he is the propitiation, he's implying directly that he's enough on his on, on his own, that, 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 that his blood is enough to cover our sins and everything. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. I think I think the key here the the two key concepts here are is payment and sufficient payment. Okay, that's good. Mitch? I'd say that that's, uh, that's uh, accurate, that he took our place, but he took our place because we couldn't pay. He was the one that had the righteousness to be able to pay, since our righteousness wasn't good enough. So he took our place because he was the one that had the, had the clout, if you will, uh, and, and the... Um, the amount of perfect righteousness to pay to take our place. Well, yeah, he's the only one that could do it because uh, we completed uh, the last series that we did on this program was we looked at uh, the Old Testament pictures and shadows of Jesus' blood atonement, and we we saw that uh, the Jews were playing out this this act, acting out this scene over and over again in in a hundred different ways, uh, illustrating that someday. Uh, um, Someone would die for the sins of the world, and God would provide this Lamb of God. So Jesus were, but the Jews would find a Lamb, and it had to be perfect, without any blemish, uh, no defects. And so the, the, the only thing that is satisfactory uh, would be a sinless perfect, a person to be sacrificed. God had to become a man, uh, this sinless person who could be sacrificed for our sins. That's the only way that it would be uh, satisfactory. Now, other words that I think associated with propitiation is success. In other words, it was a success. His death was succeeded in, in solving the problem. Sins are paid. Paid in full is another one, another term that I use associated with it. Uh, when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, he said, that's it. Nothing else needs to be done. It's satisfactory, it's successful, it's painful, it's finished. And another word that we identify with this is atonement. So a propitiation for our sins means that the sins have been atoned for. It's, it's done. So 
we see Jesus as the Son of God, as uh, this uh, God-man, and we see him also as this propitiation for our sins. Um, now, in John 1.29, says, The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Mitch, uh, well, what do you say about that? Well, um, I'd like to... That, that kind of ties into what I've been reading right here uh, in uh, John chapter 17, where uh, these things Jesus spoke. And lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, he was speaking to the Father, the hour has come, glorify thy Son, that the Son may glorify thee. Even as thou givest, and I'm reading the these and thou's here, even, even as you have given... Him authority over all mankind that to all whom are given him he may he may give eternal life I'm kind of paraphrasing because I don't want to read it in that in those these and thou's there uh, so so when he says that the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world and now said now looking up to heaven and saying the hour has come for me to for, for, for you to glorify me and for me to glorify you by 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 dying or, or being a propitiation for sins, he also prayed for all people that would come to him, the, all those that would be given him. So it all kind of ties together in that he is the one, and that he is one to be glorified, and one who has looked up to the Father to give glory and to get glory back and forth. So now we're talking about. Um, you know, I and the Father and the one are one in equality with God in, in, in the idea of glory, glory going to the Son for being uh, able to be a propitiation for sin or having that authority to be that because of his perf perfection and also uh, looking at the Father as, as somebody that he's praying to, it seems like here we have a distinction between uh, essences of, uh, of holiness and glory. Okay, and now what about the title that John the Baptist, he points to Jesus, says, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. When he refers to him as the Lamb of God, what what uh, distinctly does that, uh, what's the significance of that? Well, that's the sacrifice, that's the blood. Um, and, of course, we, we looked at this um, before, where, where Moses had put, uh, had told the people that, in order to be saved, or, or order the firstborn, or the inherit the ones that would he inherit um, in the household would be saved. You would have to paint lamb's blood over the doorposts, in the shape, by the way, of, of a cross, making a cross. Uh, this uh, is very significant because it looks forward to Jesus being that same lamb that that made uh, a sacrifice for us, so that this way the killing angel or the one that would judge us would pass over us seeing the one that died for us, the propitiation. Mm -hmm. So the Lamb of God is not just some cute little fuzzy little term uh, of endearment. Uh, it, it is very significant, particularly to Jews who understand that a lamb had to be sacrificed uh, for their sins and Jesus is called this lamb who would die for their sins. But he'd be the final lamb, the only one that really succeeded, the only one truly was a propitiation for our sins. Okay, can we go, let's go to 14, John 14, 6 now. A lot in this verse. Uh, uh, Jesus saith unto him, um, this is, I think, Jesus is answering uh, uh, the apostle, who says, show us the way to the Father. When Jesus says, the Father and I are one, he says that, uh, show us the way to the Father. That's where you're going. And he says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So let's start off with when Jesus claims to be, I am the way. The way. Uh, now there's a problem. A lot of people grab a hold of this and, and will use this to promote a heresy by uh, Jackson. Uh, you want to tell us what that is and then tell us the true meaning of, of what it means to be the way. The way, you're, you're totally right. People like to use that this term way to promote heresy. But 
really what Jesus is saying, he says, I am the way. He doesn't say a cooperation between you and I are the way to, to the Father and everything. He says, no one comes to the Father but by me. I, I want to I wanna stress on the importance of the point that he is talking about himself and himself alone. You know, it's like if I say, if I say I'm gonna, if I say I'm gonna call you, Luke, on the phone, I'm implying that I'm gonna call you, you and only you, unless I say actually somebody else is gonna be included in our phone call. You know, so I actually think the exclusivity of Jesus claiming to be the way is is um, is incredibly important here. Yeah, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, some people viewing may be familiar with uh, C.S. Lewis. Book, uh, um, I think it was in Mere Christianity, but he used the point that uh, Jesus um, claimed to be God, and therefore you have to conclude that he was either God, as he claimed, or he was a liar, or he was a lunatic. You only have three choices, Lord, liar, or lunatic. So imagine if anybody was saying to you, how do you get to heaven? You say, well, I'm the, I'm the way to heaven. I'm the only way. You've got to go through me. Uh, you know? <laughs> well, you have to say, that's, a, that's an unbelievable claim that you make. What, yeah. How boastful to say that you're not, you're, not, you're not only saying you're the way to heaven, you're saying you're the only way. Like, all these other religions are wrong. They're, they're, there's no other way except through you. This is how much he nailed it down that he was boasting. That I am the only way you're going to get to heaven to everybody. Mitch? Okay, well, this is Old Testament, by the way, this way. And I think I brought this up. The Jews call this the Derek. And in the Old Testament, Moses said, Do not swerve to the right or to the left of the path. It's the same thing as way. But the problem was, was that the Jews could never follow the law perfectly. Hence, the sacrifices that were made that were a picture of the true way, through the blood. But you see, the Jews miss that. And they do things called mitzvah, or mitzvahs. When we heard the word bar mitzvah, mitzvah means doing the law, doing good work, following the way. But when Jesus is saying, I am the way, we have to look at it as what Jesus' name is. God saves, not your works, not you following the Derek perfectly, because part of following that Derek or way was sacrificing in the Old Testament, showing that you were looking forward to the blood. And there's another quote that says, there is no other name under heaven by which man will be saved, right? Well, that name is, I don't save. I follow and I can only go to heaven through the blood of Jesus Christ because Yeshua, God saves and not me through the blood. So, so this whole uh, uh, way here is, is tying into Moses' way, which was actually looking towards the blood, but in the Jew's eye, it was following the path, not swerving to the right or the left, doing, doing good works in order to get to heaven. But in actuality, the real way was to look at the sacrifices that God had provided, the blood, and that was the only way because you had to have an atonement for you to be able to get into the kingdom because your own personal righteousness couldn't get you there. Right, you would need good works without ever ceasing and without ever sinning, which we obviously, if any, any honest person admits, is totally impossible. Yeah. Uh, has, you've seen that last video I just made called uh, Cheap Law, that people who think that they can somehow uh, follow law of the commandments and somehow uh, merit favor with God by doing that, that they're, they're actually cheapening what the law requires. The law requires perfection, and if you think that you can you can satisfy God by your, through your own ability to follow the law and all the commandments, then you're saying that the, the law does not require perfection. Uh, so this is another point when people want to use this part that says, I am the way, and try to imply that uh, the way means that you're following all Jesus' commandments. You're doing everything he said to do, that's the way. Well, no, it's not. the way is not based on what you do because you'll, you'll fall short and you'll be using cheap law, diluting, watering down the strictness of the law. And therefore, uh, it can't be based upon uh, you following a particular way, following, serving, 
discipleship, all that stuff. No, it has to be the fact that Jesus is the way because we yoke ourselves to him. And because he goes to heaven, we get to go with him because we're yoked to him. Jesus said, my yoke is easy. Uh, my burden is light. So when we believe in Jesus, we're believing into him. Uh, we are in Christ. Christ is in us. And we are yoked to him, connected to him. And therefore, because of that, that's the way we get into heaven. Now, the next part is, I am the way, the truth. I am the truth. Now, it's important that he, he says, he's not using the word a. I'm not a way. I'm not a truth. He's saying the way, the. And he goes on to end the whole thing by saying, no one comes to the Father but by me. So he's making this so exclusive, excluding any other way, excluding any other truth. He is the truth. Truth. So, Mitch, what's, what's it mean when Jesus claims that he is the truth? Well, when we look at the Old Testament Ten Commandments, the first one was, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. You know, you shall not bow down or make an idol. And now we look at Jesus, and Jesus is not separate from who, who the Father is, but he is the truth. Any other way following your own self-righteousness or going off and praying to idols there is no other truth but him all other ways are not the truth he is the truth and he is the way through his blood and he is the life through his blood it reminds me of when Jesus was asked of uh, uh, the, the Jewish uh, the very religious Jews asked Jesus what works does God require us to do and he said the work of God is this believe on the one who sent. So in other words, they're looking for some kinds of uh, uh, something that uh, that it was irrelevant. All the stuff that they had in mind as possible works that they God might expect them to do, they were irrelevant. And Jesus said, no, there's only one thing that's relevant here. The only truth you need to know is me. I am the truth. All the other truths and, and ways and things that you're trying to... Uh, endeavor for or learn about, uh, these are irrelevant. You want to know what the truth is? I am the truth. It's the only truth you need. And the life. That he is the life. Mitch? Um, yeah, there, there's... I was just listening to what you're saying, and I often I, I, I forget my place, but... Um, um, yeah, uh, he is definitely uh, the only truth that there is. There's no other other way uh, to to get to heaven except through through his through his way through the blood. Um, if you can recap for half a second, I probably could find my place again because I think I had something significant to say. Yeah, Jesus says, "I am the way, the truth, and the life." So the life. Uh, some people might argue the life means uh, Jesus tells you how you should live your life. Oh, I, I know what it was. It was that this is the work of the Father. They ask you, what works do we do to be saved? And he says, this is the work of the Father. This is God's work. This is his work. It's not your work. And that's the mystery. I was talking to my wife the other day. And she said, what, what do you think the mystery of the gospel is? People keep shaking their heads and thinking, well, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? What do I need to do? Well, you need to you you can't do anything. You're powerless. It's the work of the Father that does everything. Even puts it belief in your heart. Okay, brother, I'm gonna give you a thumbs up here. I've never heard anybody let me see how I get there. There you go. So, I, I, um, the the work of God is this. That's exactly how that verse goes. Jesus says the work of God is this. Until now, until I had an Asperger guy bring this to my attention, I never really made that connection that, it's, that he's talking about the work of God. The work of God is this, that you believe, in other words, this is what this is what you need to do to satisfy God. This is the only requirement, but it's God that's doing it. God is providing the solution. God sent his son, who is fully God, sent him to die for your sins. That's the work of God. Just believe in that. Okay, amen. Amen. Uh, Jackson? 
<laughs> is that a new little revelation that Mitch gave us? Uh, not really. I had actually always I've been thinking about that for quite some time. Wait, and you guys, you're you're like you have a Vulcan mind meld with <laughs> Asperger's. <laughs> yeah, I have, I've been thinking about that because because I remember I I I get into a lot of discussions with with fellow students and stuff, and a lot of times when I talk about work, sometimes I've made the point, you know, it's his good works, it's Christ's good works, and not our own, and. Yeah, that so so yeah, that's actually oh, quite honestly, that's kind of that's familiar to me. So, okay, so let's go on to the next point. This is the question of life. And I pose the question. Uh, some people will argue when Jesus says He is the life, that that is, uh, they would take that to mean that uh, He shows you how you should live your life. Right. I used to think that actually. So. Okay. So what I want to explain more about what that. A viewpoint is and why it's wrong. What I am the life really means. Jackson. Well, I think that I, I think that it means it means eternal life. If I look, if you look at it really closely, because I think I think if you, it, he throughout the Gospel of John, he's talking about you know he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. That's John 6, 47, for example. And he uses the word life over and over again. So I actually, I used to be kind of persuaded because he says life without saying eternal life. But at the same time, it's you don't have to say eternal before life every single time for it to mean that, for example. You know, just like... Here's an example on this. Uh, I don't remember the, date, the address of the verse, but there's a verse that says, he that believeth on the Son hath life, and he that believeth not the Son hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Right, right. You don't have to say the whole title every single time. Like, I go to Colorado State. I don't have to say the Colorado State Rams just to refer to our sports team every time. I can just say the Rams, and it has the same meaning. Does that make sense? Yeah, very good. And also, um, you know, when we have Brother Mitch with us, you know, he's always, like, pulling in the reins and saying, context context. <clears throat> so if we're going to stay focused on the context, then the closest context is the very end of the verse. And at the end of the verse it says, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So this is the, this final part of this verse is clarifying what these other things really refer to. I am the way to the Father. I am the truth you need to know to get to the Father. I am the life, the everlasting life you get through me in, with the Father in heaven. Hmm. Yes, I am the way and the truth and the life. The life in the Old Testament was in the blood of the animal. That's why you couldn't drink the blood of an animal because it had. It, it was said in the Old Testament not to drink the blood of the sacrifice. Why? Because that blood was not good enough. Uh, it was not. It was the life of the animal. But when Jesus said, "You must drink." eat my flesh and drink my blood. He was talking about the life that's in the blood. So um, the Jews can look at this from two different directions. They can believe that the life is what I said before, the derech or the way. And this is what the, a lot of uh, Christians now believe in this thing called the didashi, which were all these rules that were put down by Judaizers or, 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 or the early Jewish Christian believers, these people who were followers of law. But really, the life, or the, the it, it didn't, didn't tell you how to live your life like the Derek. It said he, it is the life, and the life is in the blood, and that was the mystery, that the blood of the sacrifice, and even it goes back to the tree of life. Remember that on the day that they ate of the fruit of the law, they died. And so that tree that was in the middle of the garden that we mentioned was life. It was the fruit. It was the fruit of the law, the knowledge of good and evil, and then there was the fruit of, of life, the tree of life. Well, Jesus is the tree of life, and his fruit, all right, basically it's like grapes. It's, it's blood. It's, 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 it's the same fruit, I believe, that was in the garden that was protecting them from the law to begin with. When they ate of the law, they were no longer under grapes. And so when it says it's the life, it's giving them back the fruit in the garden that they should be eating of, which was grace. But they started eating of the law. So it, it really, when you bring it together, it, it sort of comes full circle. I think it's a beautiful picture. 
Yeah. Well, let me tell you, congratulations, because now in one hour we've completed what we did last time in two hours, so we're all caught up, and the lost episode is recovered. <laughs> now we're now we're going to move on to, uh, and I want you to, to uh, bear with me because the verses we're going to be going through here are not in necessarily a logical sequence, um, but I'm, we're going to go over these verses, and you might or might be wondering well, why that one next, but uh, just humor me. We're looking at Revelation 1.8. It says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Okay. Who dares to, to explain that verse? Who dares? Jackson? Yeah, this is, I, 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 I think just now something came to me, and while I think there are many, many verses that affirm the deity of Christ and everything, I've got to say, so far I think Revelation 1.8 is the, most, the very most powerful I've ever seen. I'll just give that input. Okay. Yeah, definitely it's, it's so powerful, but... Uh... Uh, really, I don't know how anybody can come to any other conclusion unless they say that this verse is not talking about Jesus. But uh, um, it's red letter. Brother, what's that? It's red, red letter. letter. It's, it's red letter. letter. <laughs> okay. Okay, brother Mitch. Let's start off. Well, first, expand on the whole thing as a, in general. Then we'll go point by point, Mitch. Well, I think in the Old Testament, I think it's Aleph Taf. Uh, I think it's Aleph Taf, which is which is the Hebrew. Alphabet first and last, or tav or tas. There's two letters that are like a T. There's the tav and the test. But aleph, uh, uh, you know, we get the aleph bet uh, from the from uh, you know uh, languages like the Hebrew language. Uh, so uh, I believe in the Old Testament. I think it was in Isaiah. He also called himself the first and the last, uh, the beginning and the end. So um, you know, this is a this is a statement of eternity, really, because there was no beginning or end. He's the beginning and the end. And so, uh, when he says, "I'm the Alpha and Omega," he's also quoting the uh, the Old Testament, where he b before he was even revealed as as the as the Father. And other statement says, "There's no other rock besides me in the Old Testament," where Jesus is considered the rock. So this is this is definitely equating himself uh, with 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 um, with being um, uh, on par with the Father. Okay, so Alpha and Omega refers to uh, eternal, eternal. The A and Z, the A to the Z. Yeah, the beginning, the end, the A to Z, the everything, the eternal. In other words, there's no uh, that shows you the eternity, it, the the uh, eternal. What's the word? Uh, that Jesus had a, is exists eternally. Doesn't have a beginning. Doesn't have an ending. Okay, and then it says. Who is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. So, what does? How can we make sense of this? He says, "Who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty." Well, he always is, because he's the he, he he he's he's the he's like the great I am who always is, but he also came to Earth, and so he died. And so he was, and then he was re resurrected. So I really think that this statement is talking about the essence of the Father coming to Earth, then was because he was on the planet, but then was resurrected into heaven. So this was here, the mystery of this was, was it was almost like somebody had came to Earth and was, like like my father who, who lived and died and he was. But, but in this case, he was and is at the same time, and always will be. Yeah. Once again, I think we're, we've debunked the, 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 the Archangel Michael claim with this verse, too, because if he's the Archangel Michael, that means he's a created being, because right. God created the angels and the de demons. And this, to me, really clearly says he wasn't created. I don't see how you can say he is and was and is to come if he was a created being. That just doesn't make any logical sense to me. So, 
Yeah, I, I agree that this uh, idea of is, was, and is to come talks about the incarnation uh, and the, the death and resurrection and the, the, the second coming. All those things are alluded to here. But the, the, to me, maybe the most powerful of all is the final point, the Almighty. The Almighty. Uh, I like to uh, refer to Jesus as God Almighty. Then, there, then there's no, there's no uh, question about uh, what I think of him in terms of he's the Son of God, but not really God himself. Right? Some people say, yeah, he's the Son, but not. They don't equate that to people with God. Too. What's that? I've actually run into people who tried to argue that too. Well, he's the Son of God, but he's not God, and now I've got this verse. So. Yeah. Well, also, you take that back to, uh, I was talking about Isaiah. I was pretty sure it was in 44. So, yeah, uh, Isaiah, if you read Isaiah 44, verses 6 to 9, or 6 to 8, it's pretty clear. And it says, thus says the Lord. Now, this Lord is in capital letters, L-O-R-D. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. This one here, and his Redeemer. I am the first and I am the last. So here says the, the, the Lord, I am the first, I am the last. And there is no God besides me. But it also says, and his Redeemer. And there is no God besides me. And who is like me? Let him proclaim and declare it. Yes, let him recount it to me in order. For from the time that I established the ancient nation and let them declare to them the things that are coming, and the events that are going to take place, which I think is talking about the cross, do not tremble and do not be afraid. Have I long since announced it to you and declared it? And you are my witness. Is there any God besides me, or is there any other rock? I know not one. Yeah. So uh, another verse says uh, uh, God is, is the only Savior. And then also scriptures say Jesus is the Savior. Mm -hmm. So it's through just deduct, deductive logic uh, or, or uh, the process, I uh, forgot what how that, that's, uh, the, the term for it, but uh, we conclude that if only God is the Savior and Jesus is the Savior, therefore Jesus is God, the Savior. Um, now, so, but the Almighty, uh, there's, there's no other... Um, way of getting around it. The Almighty is one person. One, one. Uh, I want to say person, but uh, well, there's one God. You know, the Bible says over and over, there's one God. There's no other but just one. And uh, this is the Almighty. And yet, this here is talking about Jesus. It says he is the Almighty. Mm -hmm. So he is God Almighty, fully God, getting all the glory. Uh, that the, the Father gets, the Holy Spirit gets, entitled to all the glory without considering it robbery and, and equal. He is Almighty. Uh, now here's one that um, uh, it, some people will argue against this verse because it's, uh, it's King James, it's not in other translations. Uh, this is a good argument why King James uh, may be the best, but uh, 1 John 5, 7. It says, For there are three that bear a record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Uh, there are three that bear a record in heaven. Uh, this is probably the, the greatest Trinitarian verse uh, in the Bible. Um, people say, does it say Trini the word Trinity is not in the Bible? I say, well, just read 1 John 5, 7, and that tells you what the Trinity is. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Now, we know the Word, as we're going to come to in the next verse, and we're going to talk about John, that Jesus is the Word. So it says there you got Father, you got Jesus, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So they're one God, and yet there's the Father, the Word, and there's three. 
Uh, now, so, some people will argue that these three are one. It says they're one in agreement. They're of one mind, as we discussed earlier, when Jesus said the Father and I are one. But no, I, I say that this, this is one in substance, one in equality. Uh, okay, so who wants to take a stab at that verse there? Um, I'm still reading it. I'm just give me a... Jackson, you got something to say? For there are three that bear record in heaven. Well, I mean, it's... It, 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 it seems to me like when it says that there... This is just, this is just a thought I had. Um, it says these three agree... In one, I'm, I'm reading out of the King James right here. Uh, yeah, but that's not the exact verse. That's the previous or the following verse. Oh, okay. So we're talking about five seven. First John, first John five seven. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't. I don't know. I've heard that this verse is only in the Latin manuscripts. With yeah, the, it's in. It's in. Now I'm not a KJV only. I was KJV right. only for many years, and I've studied. Uh, I was convinced of it. I've read. You know, 40 books uh, on the subject, and uh, I'm no longer KJV only, but but I do believe that there are a few verses in the KJV that the other manuscripts don't have that are critically important, and this is the greatest verse of all to show the, the, the Trinity. So uh, I will certainly hold on to this because it's the best we've got far short of the Trinity. Some people argue that we shouldn't be there, but uh, that's that's another that's yeah. another debate. Well, yeah, and actually the manuscripts, too, about the woman caught in adultery, I think, are only in the majority text as well. But, yeah, I think I think that, um, going back to your original question here, though, when it says bear record, I wonder exactly what that, what, what, what that means. Have you ever thought about that, you know? Because a record is something that's like, like the Bible's a record of Jesus' life in, in the Gospels of it. It's also a record of a lot of other things. So I wonder what that means exactly. Well, uh, does anybody have a, maybe in other translations, it doesn't say bear record. Maybe it says something else. So maybe, maybe we can learn something from that. Um, I, I don't know. I, I can't go back and forth from these programs to look at uh, the different uh, translations of it. Well, I'd just like to look at the the, uh, the beginning of the of 1 John. Uh, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes. And this is almost speaking uh, to Gnostics that they believe that, that, that somehow or another God is existential. Uh, yes. uh, and what we beheld and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. We're talking about the word of life. And the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. So, um, so this is, I guess, uh, uh, the witness of what we've seen, what was with the Father and what was manifested to us. Mm -hmm. Now the word manifest, uh, a lot of people who don't understand modalism they, they see manifest and that there's no like uh, uh, alarms going off. Uh, they just say God became a man, or God was manifest in the flesh as God, and he became a man. But, but the modalist would use the, man, the word manifest as a way of changing modes. He, he changed modes uh, and became uh, the word, or the, um, a man. So. Uh, that's another verse. Uh, before, before, before we get off on that, let's let's stay on this First John five seven. We'll close. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. So we know that Father is God Almighty. We know that Jesus Christ is called the Word in first chapter of John, and also here in the first chapter of, of First John. Uh, Miss just read that that Jesus referred to as the Word. Uh, so we got the Father. Uh, is, is God Almighty, the Word, and they got, we know that all through scriptures it says the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, is uh, God Almighty. And it says that these three are one. Now, getting back to this idea of oneness, are they one in the same person that just changes forms, is manifest in one form or another? 
uh, or are they one in substance? And uh, what was the word you used besides substance? Essence. Essence. Essence or substance, or are they one in agreement? In terms of we are, they are of one mind. They agree. Well, this is kind of interesting. I happen to have an NKJV right here, New Testament. Yeah. You know what it uses to translate? Because remember, I was talking about bear, about bear record or the record thing. The yeah, human. Okay, so. This one's this translation says, "For there are three that bear witness in heaven." So this is really interesting to me because Jesus bears witness. What is a witness? It's ev like like giving evidence of, giving a testimony of, and. I think actually that, that if this translation is is correct, and I, that doesn't mean the KJV is incorrect, but if this precise meaning is what it means, I think that actually argues against modalism too, because if they're all bearing witness of God Almighty, that seems a little bit different than this transformer idea. Yeah, if there are three bearing witness in heaven, it sounds to me like there are three simultaneously right. at the same time bearing witness in heaven, and of course. Another problem with modalism is the idea that uh, we've got the Father on the throne and the Son sitting on his right hand side, so that you've got two simultaneously existing Father and Son right there. Uh, and while I'm at it, let me tell you my main problem with modalism. Uh, you alluded to this earlier where Jesus prays to the Father and he has these conversations with the Father. Uh, he, is he schizophrenic or he's like a crazy person? Or, or is, are, are these two distinct persons in the right. Godhead, and Jesus is talking to him? And then you have the two scenes. Uh, one is the baptism, one is the, trans, uh, the transfiguration. Mm -hmm. uh, where at the, at the baptism, you have Jesus, God manifest in the flesh, word, word became flesh and lived among us as Jesus, being baptized. And then you have the Father speaking from heaven, and you hear his voice, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. They seem to be two distinct, uh, there, there's a distinction there. And then you have John claiming he saw the Holy Spirit uh, ascending from Jesus in the manner of a dove. So you have simultaneously three of them, uh, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Father, all existing uh, simultaneously as three distinct persons. Right, right. I'm glad you made the suggestion, too, of looking at another translation, because the, the way the NKJV stated with this verse and the manifest thing, I think that kind of totally des destroys that. So. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to look at the verses with the interlinear uh, a lot. I like to read the interlinears because I can see it in the, in the, in the Greek anyway. Um, mm -hmm. As far as this, um, the three that bear witness, can we define the spirit, the water, and the blood? That are in agreement. Well, well, the spirit, the water, and the blood. Now that's a different verse that I cited here, but that's. Uh, the, well, this is John. This is First John five seven. Um, or eight. Yeah. Where there are three that bear witness: the spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these and three agree. Agreement. They agree. See, so that's a different verse. Uh, five seven doesn't say they agree. It says these three are one. And well, that's why I'm reading First John five seven. It says, and it is what the spirit witness because the spirit is the truth. Yeah, but see, you're not reading KJV. That's the that's the whole problem. With okay. It. KJV is the only one that has First John five seven as it. And and then KJV. So the new KJV does too. Well, it does. It, like I said, I read it, but it says bears witness instead of for these are the record. But it actually. Yeah. I just read it from the NKJV. So. Yeah, but it, but it does have the verse, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. It well, does have that in there. Let, um, me, yeah. let me double check on that. I'm pretty sure yes, but yeah, it's a, it says in 1 John 5, 7 here, yeah, for there are three who bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. That's out of the New King James. Okay, now, now let's, let's talk more about we know who the Father is. We know who the Holy Ghost is. Let's look at the John chapter 1. Um, John chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 1 are the greatest books in the Bible to tell you the deity of Jesus Christ. Uh, Hebrews 1 is my favorite of all. Uh, but uh, in John 1, uh, I'm going to read a few of these verses. In the beginning was the Word, 
And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, if we believe in monotheism, then we have to believe that, uh, not as the Jehovah's Witness would put it, they put the word A in there, say the word was a God. And yet they claim to be monotheistic, but they just say he's a God, in other words, that there's more than one God, or there's, there's a great God Almighty, and then there's lesser gods. But this says, the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. So here we have established that the word is God. And then it says, he was with God at the beginning, through him all things were made. This is referring to Jesus. Uh, without him nothing was made that has been made. And then we go down to verse 14. It says, the word became flesh and lived among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So here we have the identity revealed of the word. But the word is another name for Jesus, the Son of God. And then when we look back at 1 John 5, 7, we see the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. So you can see it's talking about Father, Son, the Holy Ghost being one. Mm -hmm. So the Word is Jesus, is what you're saying. Yeah. Yes. Jesus is the Word. Yeah. First John, 1, John 1 and 1 John uh, 1 both seem to parallel one another. Yeah, I was surprised when you read that because I didn't have that memorized. I was I was happy to see that there's a lot of great stuff in First John, uh, mm -hmm. but then there's a lot of there's a lot of confusing stuff too. Really. Yeah, there is, and it, I I think I've taken it apart. But you know what? I probably need to redo a lot of the videos that I did where I actually started to take the context. I think yeah, I saw you did that verse by verse, and it was excellent. So right, right. So I, I recommend everybody watch his video on First John. It was really, really good. If I don't have it up, I'll have to remake it, but I'll, I'll read okay. it. Yeah, Yankee Arnold actually also has a great sermon on First John 3.9 that I think Born Again 771, I think, uploaded, and I highly recommend everyone watch that. So mm -hmm. That's Brother Jose. Okay, um, now we look. let's look at... Um, it's clearly stating that the Word is God. It says, He was with God at the beginning, through Him were all things made. In other words, He's, he's saying that the Word is the Creator, and the Word is God, and he was, with, he was in the beginning, He was with God, He is God, and so on. So there's really nothing that could be, uh, uh, you can't come to any other conclusion that the Word is God Almighty, and yet down here it says the Word became flesh and lived among them. Now when it says the Word became flesh, uh, that would be another way of a modalist saying, see, this is the Word, this is God Almighty, became flesh. So he was, he changed into a man, he uh, was manifest or changed modes to operate as a man. So, but we, as we discussed earlier, we've given examples of either Jesus being schizophrenic or he's, he's actually uh, having a conversation with the Father. The Father and the Son are sitting side by side on the thrones right now, and we also have the the, uh, the baptism. All three showed up simultaneously, and we have the transfiguration that I alluded to. And you have at the same time you have the, the same thing. You have the Father speaking, uh, obey, uh, do what my Son says. As Jesus is in the transfiguration with Moses and Elijah, and the uh, Peter what is it Peter and John or somebody who or Andrew or whoever watched the Transfiguration, they're observing this and they're seeing Jesus being transfigured and then the Father is speaking, this is my Son, do, do what he says. So you have here an example of the Father and the Son simultaneously existing as distinct persons. So to me these things are deal killers for modalism, even though modalism to me, there's a lot of verses that seem to support it until you, until you consider that. Right. Okay, now let, can we move on now to Colossians 1, 15 through 19. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. 
He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning of and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. God was pleased to have all his fullness well in him. Okay, this is talking about Jesus, so uh, how about just an overview, and then we'll go verse by verse on it. You know, this is this is really great, um, especially when we go from the. If you, I really encourage people to read the first chapter of John over and over, but then to read these other verses a lot. Um, he is um, the spirit that manifests or gives witness, that opens up, that gives light to us to see who he is and reveal to people who he is. The the the. The, the, the Spirit of God, the three distinct people that we see, the Spirit, the, the, the Jesus himself, and, 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 and the blood himself, and all the fullness of the Father dwelling in him, but all the fullness of the Godhead. Um, I mean, this, this is uh, basically saying, it's not saying that, that it's the same person, but the fullness of the Godhead. And when we see uh, from previous verses that he was with God and was God, but then he, he became flesh, it doesn't say that he changed, but that he, he came down from heaven and, and was manifest. Because if he had changed, he would have been God himself changing into flesh. And there would have been no separation between God being, the, 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 being prayed to or... or and, and God on earth. So uh, when I, I look at these, these verses, really giving glory to, to, to the, the manifestation of salvation, but not being the Father himself, but being the Son who came to the earth for us, it just seems very distinct to me when you start to read these. And, and so it, it really does... Uh, uh, kind of bring home the idea of a, of a Trinitarian uh, point of view. Yeah. I would, yeah, I would just pretty much echo everything that Mitch just said here. Um, I think that I, I think a lot of the modalist arguments, while, while it is good that they recognize that Jesus is God, they've gotten that far, it seems like many, many of their arguments to me are, are surface-based and not, not depth-based. I think when you really dig into things like we're doing here, you know, I don't know how you would explain these verses as a modalist or whatever, because it seems so much like, yes, that, that these two things are coexisting, Jesus being God and the God and the Father being distinct from one another. Because, I mean, when it says... Go ahead. No, we finish your thought. Well, I was just going to say... It just, he's talking about, you know, the Son and everything with the hope of the Lord Jesus. Then it says, at verse, um, we'll see, where was it? I just got it. Giving thanks to the Father, which has made us partakers. I mean, it seems like they're giving thanks to the Father, and yet the Son is, is coming. I mean, it seems kind of strange. To, uh, I, he doesn't say like he sent himself, you know, so. Yeah, I don't think, uh, I don't think he's schizophrenic here. I don't think he's yeah. like split personalities. I don't think yeah. God is a split personality okay. coming down here, you know, being separate people. You know, one minute uh, I'm Mitch and the next minute I'm Luke and the next minute like like we're three people on the screen but we're actually we're almost like almost like, like Clark Kent from Superman. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, let's go let's break this down just uh, word for word here. Uh, he this is referring to Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the image of the invisible God. Well, now let me let me ask something. Is is there anything that you can think of that points to Jesus existing bodily before the incarnation uh, uh, in etern in eternal state bodily? from the beginning. Mm. 
I don't know about bodily, because of course he says Emmanuel and he became flesh. But I do see him spiritually, uh, very possibly as being the one that Jacob may have wrestled with, at uh, Penuel, face to face. Mm -hmm. Panim is the word for face. And even in the three visitors that visited Abraham, there may have been a manifestation of, of uh, and even the picture of the king of Melchizedek, which is the king of righteousness and the king of peace. Who has no father or mother and no beginning of days. Yeah, I don't see any evidence that he, he came to the, actually, uh, uh, although he might have had a, a fleshly form when he wrestled, he, he might have, it might have been him that was wrestling with Jacob. Uh, but there's no, I can't, I can't, you know, I can't say with 100% with, with, uh, uh, accuracy or, or, or surety that he ever came to the flat, came to, 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 to earth by the flesh before he was born. The, the, na the name for this idea uh, is theophany or Christophany. Uh, theophany is more broad, just saying God uh, appeared as a man at and, and, uh, different times. For example, in the garden, God walked. Now, how could he walk unless he took a bodily form and walked? Uh, God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. So people would say, this is the theophany. This is God um, in, in the form of, of, of a man. God, it says, the Bible says God was made in man's image. So God took this form, or maybe existed in this form, as a man and walked with Adam and Eve. And then he appeared in these forms throughout history. Uh, Melchizedek couldn't be anybody but Jesus, in my opinion. Uh, if you study that out, uh, that we're going to do that in the future. We're going to discuss Melchizedek and some other important uh, characters, do uh, character studies in the Bible. Um, and then you've got um, in the uh, furnace of fire with uh, uh, who were the three? Uh, Abimel, um, uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Abednego. Uh, what was the, what were their names there? Um, you had the three young men in the furnace of fire, and they looked down and they said, Behold, it looks like the Son of God with them, the angel Shad of the Lord. Shadrach and Abednego? Yeah, Shad Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Abednego. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> Hard names to remember. Uh, but uh, Joshua 5 also. Joshua 5, what happened there? Well, look, it's. I, I thought just years ago I was reading this, and this just came back to me, and I was Googling a little bit, but... It says right here, and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes up, and behold, there stood a man, which seems like it could be, we're talking about bodily form, over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship, and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? That's four. That's verse fourteen. I started in thirteen, read to fourteen. And this captain of the Lord's host, and and in my opinion, seems like he's a pre-incarnate Christ from that. From what yeah, I read. because he would, if he was an angel, he wouldn't have let him bow down to him. Right, because we don't worship angels. So. Right. Well. Um, Maybe sometime we'll do a study just on the idea of Christophanies or Theophanies, where God or Jesus uh, appears uh, in form of man throughout history. Now, the question of existing before the garden as in the form of a man, the Bible, I don't believe, really explains that. Uh, so we don't really know, um, unless someone watching has an answer for us, go ahead and pose a question or tell us where to to look for that. So he is the Im image of the invisible God. The first, now here's the, here's the problem part, the firstborn over all creation. Now why is the firstborn over all creation a potential problem for uh, biblical Christians? Well, uh, first of all, um, he's firstborn in that he wasn't, he wasn't created. He's the first one that was born into heaven as the one ushering us in. And as far as 
manifestations on earth like like um, like when Moses saw the train of his robe um, and stuff like this I think it's safe to say that he was born of a, in the fle in the flesh to a woman but first born into heaven means that he was the first one that not born by a woman but born into heaven by by his sacrifice or or, or, or what he did on the cross so there's like some distinctions here that I think you can pretty much draw well, if we move down to verse 18, if you're referring to your point about the resurrection, uh, he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So uh, that's the point that supports your, your uh, statement there, that uh, it's referring to being the first of the resurrection. Mm -hmm. But the firstborn over all creation, you realize that the Jehovah Witnesses love this verse. And uh, that to cite that uh, he's the first thing God created, he's not God. But he's the first creation of God, the firstborn of all creation, the Son of God or a God or Michael, whatever they have. You have to be kind of. You have to look at words. You know, so many. There's so many. Um, um, you know, figures of speech that that or, or use, uses of words. I forget what they call them. Where where they, they they have meanings that people ascribe to them without really thinking about them. The yeah. firstborn of creation would be. It's, it, it might not be all inclusive of all creation, but firstborn of creation that that's born into heaven by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's like using the word all. You know, all not doesn't always mean all. It could be all in a certain group, or the the all that you speak about. It's a hyperbo hyperbolic speech, and a lot of times we get caught up in this hyperbolic speech and and give it. A, a, a concrete meaning when when um, um, you can't give it a concrete meaning and I think, I, I think in this case there's a there is a good answer for the Jehovah Witnesses but first let me ask Jackson if you've got anything you want to say about that um, I was I, I, right now what I was what I quickly did and I, I really recommend this website it's called biblehub.com because it lets you it lets you look at the Greek behind some of these things but I'm looking at this at this expression firstborn right here and the old, it, it's used let's see it's used three it's used three times is the beginning firstborn from the dead in revelation witness firstborn first begotten of God so I I think we have to. We my my. I haven't got an answer at the moment, but we have to be real careful as to what the meaning of this term firstborn. Sounds is. like inheritance to me. More. It was found. It sounds like more of a okay. term that now, means like yeah, having now, the right. Now, now you're getting to the point that I want to make. This okay. firstborn is. A, you're right, Mitch. That how how you are looking at the, a, a term or a word, uh, what it really meant at that time is also. Um, can give us the, the, the correct answer. And if remember, um, let me see, uh, Abraham had Isaac and he had Ishmael. Ishmael was the firstborn, right? Mm. But then he was kicked out because he was not part of God's plan and, and the firstborn status, the sole son of, uh, it, it says, remember when we discussed um, um, uh, Isaac Abraham put an Isaac on the wood to, to kill him, and he was referred to this is my only son. In other words, it's the only son that mattered because God was the one that was ordained by God. So he had the preeminence, the status of being the only one, because Ishmael was not the one that God was intended. My only son, the bond servant. And that, by the yeah. way, that that word um, um, uh, Isaac, I love it in Jewish. It's it's Yitzi, Yitzi. Yeah. Yitzi, that's cool. Yeah, uh, uh, a lot of lot of people. Mandy has a, a has a someone named uh, Yitzi. Got flown away. Um. So this idea of firstborn though doesn't mean necessarily it's referring to um, order of birth. It's talking about um, preeminence or. Uh, your position in terms of your inheritance and your uh, prestige or your power. Yeah. Uh, for example, you got Abraham had Isaac and Ishmael, then he had uh, Isaac had uh, Jacob and Esau. Right. Now, 
Now, they were born simultaneously, except they're twins, so Esau came out first, and he was the firstborn. And the firstborn is supposed to get the, the majority of the inheritance. He has this status of being firstborn, and that's called preeminence. He has the power over the rest of the family. And this idea of being firstborn to, in Jesus' case here is that it is the preeminence, the status of the, all the authority. It's not that he was the first one that God created. Hmm. So um, that is, it, it, when, you, when you look at it through that lens and you look at when Jesus is referred to as the firstborn here and uh, other places, uh, then you're going to see that uh, that is exactly what it's referring to. It's not talking about that you know, God created Jesus first. Yeah, it's it's a mirror to uh, it's it's a parallel passage to John three sixteen that says that he sent his only begotten son right there, I think. So yeah, that's real interesting. All right, now we're going to look at uh, uh, for by him all things were created. So it says Jesus created all things. This is a uh, agreeing with First uh, John, I mean John the first chapter. Uh, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers, rulers or authority, all things were created by him and for him. But a Jehovah Witness would say, well, yeah, Jesus created everything. God created him first, and then he used Jesus to create everything. So that's how a Jehovah Witness reads this verse. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Uh, and in the head of the body... He is the head of the body of the church. So now we know, again, we're talking about Jesus here because Jesus is the head of the church. Uh, he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. Now this supports Mitch's point about the resurrection. When it says firstborn from among the dead, uh, he is the, uh, the, the firstborn of the resurrection. The other people were resurrected before um, uh, Jesus. Uh, Jesus resurrected Lazarus, and I think Dorcas. Yeah, Dorcas. Uh, yeah. But, but they were resurrected temporarily, and they had to eventually die. Um, Jesus was resurrected to never die, and, and he's the only one. And then you have at the same time, then at some point, some were resurrected from the grave. Was that uh, right after Jesus was resurrected, or was that at the cross? I think that I think it was after the resurrection, wasn't it? Where you, the graves were opened up and some of the Old Testament states came out. You yeah, guys know what I'm referring to? I'm going to read that over just to make sure, but I think that I'm was pretty, I'm pretty sure that refers to at the resurrection. So you have Jesus, the firstborn of the resurrection, and then you have the, the what you, they call the, the first fruits. Um, when they, the Jews would have a harvest, you had the first fruits, and then you'd have uh, the, the, the gleanings. I don't remember how uh, all that's explained. Uh, I, I'd have to research it to do a, a real good study on it. But the idea of uh, the fruits, the gleanings, the first fruits, this is all talking about the various stages of the resurrection. Jesus being the first, and then these Old Testament saints were resurrected at that time, and then uh, when Jesus follows us off at the rapture, uh, you're going to have those dead in Christ resurrected, and that's the, uh, the this next stage of the resurrection. And then finally have the resurrection of uh, the uh, this, this saints in the uh, tribulation, and you have also the resurrection of the damned. Those, they, they talk about the, 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 the first and the second resurrection, the second being the resurrection of the just and the unjust. So everybody who ever lived, whether they're saved or not, gets resurrected. But the, those who are lost, who never trusted Jesus for salvation, they get resurrected, resurrected, and go to this great white throne judgment where they are uh, doomed, thrown into the lake of fire, and suffer the second death. But everybody else who put their faith in Jesus, they get resurrected unto eternal life. We go to the judgment seat of Christ to receive treasures in heaven for our ministries. So. This is referring to, he's the beginning of all that. He is the firstborn from among the dead, but all of us have this to look forward to. 
Uh, it's the high holiday seasons now. Is Rosh Hashanah on? A, like a, I think it might be Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur. I think Rosh Hashanah is coming up uh, sometime this month, isn't it? I, I, we might be. We might. We might be right in the middle of the high holidays right now. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. We are. Yeah. And I, 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 a lot of people believe that Rosh Hashanah. That's. I think that's the trumpets. Feast of the trumpets, isn't it? And that's the. Yeah. If yeah, you say get, get you get to New Yard, good New Year. <laughs> that's when we're there, yeah. That's when we're going to get called up, I think, at the uh, Rosh Hashanah, at the Feast of the Trumpets. Okay, now we're going to get lost here, but so let's don't be surprised this. if I'm raptured here. <laughs> if I disappear, hey, listen, you're not getting raptured without me. I'm okay. just talking. <laughs> but God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him. All His fullness dwell in Him. Oh. I guess that, uh, do you want to explain a little more about what that means? God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in, in, in Jesus. That's, that's pretty self-explanatory right there. I don't know if I can, I think if you just take this phrase right on its face, I think that that's, uh, you know, it didn't say, it didn't say, by the way, he himself was him, but all his fullness dwelled in him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, uh, to me, that's equal. All his fullness is equal. It shows this the same thing as when it says he, he did not consider a robbery to be equal with God. Equal. He did not consider it a robbery. He had all the glory that the Father has. And the Bible says that God does not share his glory with anybody. Therefore, Jesus must be God because he gets equal glory. Jesus must be God, and Lordship salvation must not be true. Yes, exactly right, because the, the Lordship salvationists, they're stealing. They are robbing glory from God by trying to uh, attribute anything that they do uh, as, as part of their salvation. See, nowhere can you find it say where Jesus says, I am the Father. He says, I am the Father are one, but he didn't say, I am the Father. He did say that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, but he didn't say I am the Father. You know, yeah. so it's funny. Why wouldn't there be some sort of plain speech? Here I am. I'm the Father. Uh, right. Never said that, and he never alluded to that. I think if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It goes along with this verse 19. For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him. When you see Jesus, you, you see all the full glory. The glory the of God. Of, of dwelling in Jesus. Um, this next one here, I'm going to Hebrews. By the way, uh, it might make sense just to read the whole chapter of Hebrews, but let's look at these few verses here on uh, Hebrews 1. I'm going to go verses 3, 6, 8, 10, through 12, and 12. Who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens and the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they will all go old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be chained. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. Uh, first chapter of Hebrews. Everybody who's watching now, Read the first chapter of Hebrews, and uh, you cannot uh, have any better uh, proof that Jesus is God Almighty when you read this. These are just a few of those verses. Uh, I think before we, we take this on, though, because this is going to, this ver these verses here I just read will probably take us uh, 30 minutes alone to go through. And mm -hmm. we're almost at our two hour mark here. So um, I think we should stop here. And pick up at this point next time, but uh, let's kind of just like any like any summary remarks summarize everything 
up to this point in any uh, uh, any way you'd like. Or if there's anything that you've uh, oh, let me say one thing. I made a note not to forget this. That's why I remember it. I saw a video from, by someone years ago uh, proving that that uh, uh, the Trinity by this verse that says God is love. I don't know if you've ever looked at it from this perspective, but there is a verse in the Bible that is is a short verse, three words says God is love, and love cannot exist without an object. So if God is love, it, if He couldn't exist in their words unless there was an object for love, and the object of love before God created creation. Uh, was this Trinity. Uh, the Father had to have a Son as an object of His love, and the Son had to have the Father as an object and the Holy Spirit as an object. So because of the love within God, that proves that there had to be, uh, in order to satisfy this, this statement of God is love, there had to be a simultaneous existence of these distinct persons in the Godhead for there to be a love with, that has an object. There's a lot said there. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I'm going to have to tie that together with uh, he who has sinned much loves much. I'd like to see how you tie that together with how great God's love is. Yep. But how... The, how how by us not being able to attain to being God by our own power, how his salvation makes it that much greater, and our adoration for his sacrifice and his love for us is even the more when we look at our... our I think Jesus uh, uh, made the point, that same point also in this parable of uh, this, this man uh, owed some money, like a hundred dollars, and uh, he was going to go to prison, but he begged the, the, the debtor to for, forgive, give him time, and the debtor forgave him. He said, okay, the debt's forgiven. And then the first thing the man did was go and, and uh, find someone who owed him $10. And he got to have him put in prison to, to get his $10. And, and uh, Jesus made the point that, uh, to, uh, that when you are forgiven more, you're even... I'm not even sure if this parable is the one I'm thinking of that makes the point, but I think if, when you're forgiven more, you're going to end up being more grateful because you had more sins that were forgiven. Than there's several, there's, right, exactly. There's several event, There's several, several, um, several times that Jesus brings this same point up. You know, uh, the prodigal son, uh, uh, the, the the one that looks next to you mentioned, uh, I think last week on the one we missed or or, or John. You know, the, the one that's beating his chest saying, I'm a sinner, and the one saying, look at that sinner, I'm glad I'm not like him. I mean, there's several there's several ones uh, uh, that, that you can point out. And it seems like it's a, it, it's a, a repetitive message throughout Scripture. Yeah, it's a, it's a greater example of God's love, the fact that more you've, the, the big, people have asked me, and you've all heard this question. Well, if what you're saying is that, that Hitler, if he believed in Jesus that Hitler would go to heaven. Yes. And they want me to back down and say, well, no, 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 Hitler was too bad or whatever. But I said, no, it doesn't matter if you're Hitler or anybody even worse than Hitler. Yeah, that, that, that question, that question itself, unfortunately, shows the self-righteousness of the person asking, unfortunately, in many cases that I've run into. Yeah. And their inability to understand that, that wow, what sin is. And James says that if you've broken the law once, then you're guilty of all. You're just as guilty as someone who sinned many times, even if you've sinned once. And so it only takes one sin to make you a filthy rag in the sight of God that is a, a, a sinner. One sin makes you a sinner. And even and if you believe in uh, the depravity of man, then, uh, then you have to understand that uh, it's not even what we do that makes us a sinner. It's what we are. It's our nature. We're born with this nature. It's a sinner. And before we even act it out, we still have a, a sinful nature. 
and that is disgusting, and that needs to be reborn. So, uh, yeah, it is self righteousness that people want to try to uh, ask questions. Say, yeah, try to determine uh, uh, based upon relative goodness. Right. Again, they don't understand what good means in the Bible. The Bible means good means that you're God, that you're uh, that you are perfect, and that all the rest of us fall short of this glory of God. The glory of God, we've shown here, we've been discussing, the glory of God is Jesus. Glory, Jesus is the standard, and we all fall short of the standard that he set. Perfection. And therefore, we all... See Hitler, if we see Hitler in heaven, he'll be going, See Chaim! See Chaim! <laughs> and obviously, we're not saying Hitler is in heaven. That's the no. other thing. Just... I wouldn't be surprised. It could happen. Uh, we're, we're, there. We're, we're, happy. See, we're, Kyle. we're saying that, we're saying that any person, no matter how bad of a sinner that uh, they appear to be, uh, yeah. the blood pays for that sin, and right. they are uh, they're not beyond salvation. Uh, right. if they just call on the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, there was no evidence that that Hitler was actually saved, but yeah. no, no, we're not even stating that. But the point is that. Um, if you get asked the question, well, what if Jesus believed? Uh, what if Hitler put his faith in Jesus before he died? Did he go to heaven? Yes, okay. yes. That's the beauty of grace. That's the beauty of God's love and forgiveness. Where none of us deserve salvation. It's all uh, God's grace and mercy, and we all need it. Hitler needs it. I need it. You guys needed it. And if you're self-righteous, thinking that you're a pretty good person, you really need God's mercy. Because you're self-righteous. It's it's like that old line in the hymn. This is the vilest offender who truly believes. I mean, hey, it says vilest offender. I really like that that part of the hymn. Yeah, I love all the old hymns are some of the best messages of salvation you'll ever find. If you really, if you really study the words of those hymns, it really has the true message of salvation. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm just thinking hours. I have Asperger's of the violent offender. <laughs> I can't, can't play the violin. Okay. I really two get hours, that. <laughs> uh, our two hours are up, so I'm going to close this. So each one of you say uh, say your goodbyes and any, any closing thought you have about the whole topic so far. Uh, you want to start, start with that, Jackson? Well, uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for inviting me to this conversation, Brother Luke. And I just got a webcam and everything. So, anyway, uh, I, I encourage everyone to watch the video on my channel where I do a brief analysis of the book I Never Knew You, because I later actually want to do a more in-depth analysis of that book. If there's a lot of good stuff in there, I would really... Because I've read that book about two or three times. So, I really encourage everyone to watch my quick, brief overview of that. Okay, good. And uh, you just made that one. That's your most recent one? Yeah, that's. I sent it to you. Boobs. Yeah, I know. I, I've got it on my to watch list. I didn't have a chance to watch it yet, so I'll yeah, watch that probably tonight it, or sir. tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, great. And uh, Mitch, uh, any summary, summary of the, the study for today? Uh, I think that it's been an excellent study. Uh, I, I did watch uh, your video, Jackson, on um, on your testimony. I thought it was really good. I haven't got it with all the homework I'm doing. I haven't got a chance to do watch watch the the video on on uh, that you did, Luke. But I'll I'll be I'll be watching that after the show. But I'll tell you that I think that this has been really nailing home how the great magnitude of who this is, especially Hebrews chapter one, who. Say who, who who gave us such a great salvation? Yeah, yeah, very good. And I would say to uh, anybody who watches this video, uh, right after the video is over, your first project should be read the first chapter of Hebrews, uh, and uh, that will really solidify it and nail it all down for you. And we're going to pick up right here where we left off next time. Let me just say finally that uh, if anybody is watching this now. And uh, you have never put your faith in our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you to do it right now. I'm not asking you to join a religion. I'm not asking you to become a religious person. Uh, I, I'm asking you to trust the Savior. Understand that you are in a hopeless condition. That you cannot uh, satisfy God and be reconciled to God based upon anything you do. 
uh, by changing your life or joining your religion or um, or praying five times a day on a rug or confessing to a priest. There's nothing you can do. Your situation is hopeless, and God understood that. So he loves us so much that he decided he would become a man. That man is Jesus Christ. He became a man that was perfect, sinless, so that he could die for our sins. And that's what he did 2,000 years ago. The sins of the whole world were charged against Jesus Christ that day. And he paid for your sins. And that you can you can be uh, rec reconciled with God right now if you just put your faith in the Savior and believe. He died for your sins, and he gives eternal life to everyone who calls on his name and believes in him for it. Believe Jesus has the ability to give you eternal life in the kingdom of God. Believe him. He alone has the ability. And believe that he will keep his promise. He promises eternal life to everyone who trusts him for it. So put your faith in him now. And if you decide to do that, please make a comment. Tell us so that we can celebrate with you. So bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.